This is Yvette Carnell with Your Black World, and right now I am uh, sitting down with Pascal Robert, who is actually a Haitian-American blogger who has blogged for the Huffington Post. He blogs for Black Agenda Report. He's been blogging since 2007. And right now I want to take some time to talk to him about an article he wrote um, which is in Black Agenda Report, and it's in the Huffington Post, but it talks about black leadership in America, the lack of black leadership in America, and, and, and how we need to sort of reorient uh, what we think of as, as good leadership. So the, the first thing, one of the, one of the first things that I found sort of remarkable in the article and that I don't hear about very often in terms of when I speak to black people about politics is is how some of our black leaders have actually uh, tamped down or killed grassroots movements in, in black America. And one of the things I want to really just hash out is, 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 the, is, is, is something that Pascal brought up in his article, which was the Colored Farmers Alliance back from way back when. Um, and and can, you just, can you just give me a little context, Pascal, about, about, about that alliance? And I'm, I'm going to bring that forward to, to Barack Obama, but just give, just give the people a little bit of knowledge about that. Absolutely. And Yvette, I'd like to really thank you for giving me this opportunity to, uh, to appear with you and talk about this. I've always appreciated your work. Uh, in terms of the Colored Farmers Alliance, the way that I got uh, exposed to the Colored Farmers Alliance, because it's really not a history that we talk about often in the black community, was I was reading a book, an anthology by um, Adolf Reed and a few other prof uh, scholars called Renewing Black Intellectual Thinking. And there's a chapter written by a uh, professor, I believe she's at uh, City College about Booker T. Washington and the politics upon which he came about. And what she talks about, what she details, is that how in 1890, in 1886, there was an organization called the Colored Farmers Alliance, which was basically a break off of the Farmers Alliance, which is basically a white cooperative of farmers who were pooling their political and their economic resources to protect themselves against the, I wouldn't say corporatized, but the, the large-scale farming interests in the South that were trying to exploit them. And what had happened is that the black farmers basically uh, adopted the same format and created this coalition to protect their interests, negotiate their interests economically, and to protect their interests as small-scale farmers and farm workers. And what they did is that they had conventions, they had a publication, they had an aspect of their union was to deal with health issues, family issues. It was kind of a quasi-fraternal organization. Now, understand, we're talking about less than 30 years after slavery. Many of these people were illiterate, and they had, it clearly had to be a multi-class tier organization because you had some blacks that had had large farms, and you had some blacks that were just tenant workers, all of which participating in the Colored Farmers Alliance. This organization, at its height, grew to be 1.2 million members. I mean, this is so, it's, it's such a rare part of our history that we don't talk about. It even has a Wikipedia page. You never hear, when you hear all these scholars of black history or the African American community, they never mention this organization or its history. I did find another book that references it. If you read um, uh, Stokey Carmichael or Kwame Torre's Black Power, they actually talk about the Colored Farmers Alliance. And interestingly enough, they try to use it as an example that you know, we should not make co we should not engage in coalition politics as black people. The Colored Farmers Alliance was okay, but there was still some white folk who really went totally down with the agenda. I disagree with their analysis in that I feel that 30 years after slavery, the fact that you were able to get whites who were still advocating along with the Colored Farmers Alliance on behalf of blacks, even if you had a few that betrayed them, we have black people in the black community today that betray us. I mean, we should abandon any any interacting with the black community. And that's the, his analysis, and that's actually the only text that I found that's contemporary, when I mean contemporary within the last few years, that Adre mentions the Colored Farmers Alliance. Well, we don't, and, and here's, 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 my, here's my drawing issue. When, when he, whenever, I, whenever, I, whenever I criticize Barack Obama, here's what I get. I get a group of people who basically tell me that I shouldn't be criticizing him because of, because of race, race based politics, because what I call the politics of pigmentation. But one of the things that you brought up is that a lot of the people, who are currently pretend to be advocating for the black community are actually people, you know, who are advocating for the poor, who say they're advocating for the black poor and they want the best for black poor. A lot of these people are millionaires themselves. When you look at Al Sharpton, he's a millionaire. When you look at, even when you look at, um, when you look at Tavis Smiley, he makes good money. So 
what I'm trying to figure out is, is there a way to mobilize poor people in the interest of poor people? Is there still a way to do what we did back then when black people couldn't even read and write? Is 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 that a, is that possible and feasible now? And, and the second part of that is, how do you see how do you see Obama in this? Because one of the things you brought up, and this is this was very powerful in terms of what I think about Booker T. Washington. You know, people people think of the whole Booker T. Washington versus W. E. B. Du Bois debate. But what you kind of drew out in your article is that these two people were kind of set up to be drawn as our two choices. It's almost like white people always give us two choices and say, here, Negro, you choose one of these two things. Here, Negro, you have we're giving you this black person and this black person and you choose which black person is better. So how do we get to the point where we choose our own leadership? How do we choose our own leadership? How do we say, no, we don't want Barack Obama or no, we don't want this person. These are the people we want. Like, how does that happen? Well, what, what is the, the phenomenon you're talking about is very profound, and it, it, it touches on a few things. And this this dichotomy, which I mentioned uh, using a philosophy, Hegelian dialectics, or, or or some people call it political spectrum, of kind of narrowing the right-left paradigm discourse. This is a ploy of particularly Anglo-American politics. It started in France, actually. This is, goes back to you know Renaissance, you know, you know, the, to the to the French Revolution and limiting political paradigms to a frame that are acceptable within the status quo. And uh, um, that is not accidental. That, that is something that is a, a very real and significant part of politics. And it's, it's interesting that you really bring this up. And that's one of the things that I really wanted to touch on about our black quote-unquote leaders is that we don't choose these people. I, I, don't, I know you didn't get a ballot. I never got a ballot at my, to my house to say, who's this year's black leader? I don't get They, they don't exist. What happens is that, and this is something that is, is touched upon in the article that is uh, mentioned in this book that oh, I was reading, Stirrings in the Jug, is that all of black leadership, going back to Booker T. Washington, has used white power structure as a means of ascent in the black community. From mm -hmm. Louis Farrakhan, Jesse Jackson, Marcus Garvey, all of them turn to the white establishment vehicles to garner their large-scale voice and viability in the black community. Now, I understand something. I mean, being that, you know, you are politically savvy enough, you know, is that the, the power structure and the status quo is not going to give someone that kind of megaphone unless they can use that agenda to their benefit, whether as an oppositional strategy or incorporate it and co-opt it as the status quo agenda. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? I'm following. I'm following. You know, so... When I when I read that book, that that part of of of, uh, of stories in the Jet by by Professor Reed, I really shocked me. I said, you know, I've never really thought about that, but that's true. That's that's absolutely true. Because there's always a need to deal with the media. There's always a need to deal with uh you know uh, the political structure at that time. There's always a need to interact with the corporate sector as well at that time. And all of these individuals always seem to flock to the traditional. Uh, media paradigms or corporate paradigms or political paradigms to elevate themselves. And, and then, uh, that, go ahead, continue, please. Go ahead. No, no, no. And you know what's, we, well, you know what's crazy about that? Is that when you look back at the legacy, and I'm, I'd like you, you, you said in the article you weren't trying to tear down Booker T. Washington, and I'm not either. But it's amazing to me when you look at his legacy how, you know, his Tuskegee machine, as you said in the article, was used to um it was used to kind of you know tamp down the the the, the movement i'm going to i'm going to be very direct but booker t washington's tuskegee machine in the 1890s was used to neutralize probably one of the most progressive political movements in american history in the late wow. 1890s wow and and when you look at it when i think of that in the context of barack obama when i look about when i think about what was happening in before the ascent of Obama. You had a lot of people in America who were upset about the reign of George W. Bush, who were saying, we don't want this anymore, we don't like what we're seeing anymore. And so basically what they gave us was a black man and a white woman and said, here, here's the change you can believe in. You know, these are just, they were both idols and they were both just representations of, 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 of minority voters, but people latched on to that. And in the same sense, you had both of those people kind of used as tools, you know, Hillary Clinton for the progressive, progressive white community, women's community, well, and then you had Barack Obama. Let me, please let me interject. I, I try to avoid the old trope of, you know, they're being used, they're pawned. These people are not stupid. These people 
are vetted in ways that we don't even know. There's a very good book by a Paul Street who wrote uh, writes about Obama. He wrote about Obama in 2008. It basically talked, I think the title of the book is Barack Obama and the Future of American Politics. And he talks about how Obama, Paul Street was in Chicago when a lot of these things occurred. Obama basically was getting vetted in these kind of closed door caucuses where you'd have mm-hmm. people like Vernon Jordan and a few other thought leaders in traditional mainstream American politics from corporate elites who will start bounce questions, test questions, so on and so forth. You get a certain kind of political package. You get your your, your, you know, your cliff notes, if you will, about what is the, proper, the perfect... I mean, these people are prepped. Let's not... Do not think yeah. that in America... Yeah. Our politicians rise up organically like some kind of Huey Long character. That doesn't exist in America. These people are well prepared. They go through a whole chain of, 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 of preparation and screening. And when they get to a point where they're signing on to an agenda, they are well aware of what they're signing on to. And right. can I ask you a question, Pascal? And here, here's the question for me. This is this is the pivotal question for me. I don't know what the question is for other people. This is the pivotal question that I have. And, and then we, we can spin off of that. But I'm trying to figure out in myself, I, you know, I've said that black people and, you know, it kind of pained me to say it. And I, I got some criticism for it. But I, I said the black people weren't ready for a black president anyway. But here's my question. Why do we always fall for it? You know, Barack Obama did not necessarily he didn't come up from any grassroots movement. You know, there, in, in terms of his resume, you know, there are some things on there that are a little sketchy and it's a very thin resume. So even in terms of that. Why do we see that person and automatically say to ourselves, this person is part of our team. This person plays for our team. Why are we so easily duped in that way? Well, this is a very this is a very important question. And this this really goes back to the history of black politics and black political history. There's a very good book. It's a very old book. It's written in the 70s by a professor called The The Golden Age of Black Nationalism. Um, I forget the author's name. And he basically talks about black nationalism. Now, you think by the title that he's speaking about black nationalism in a positive way. He's actually not. He's basically making the statement that black nationalism rested on many, many, many problematic notions about race, identity, and politics in America. And one of it was that his basic premise is that black nationalism in its classical form is not a progressive movement. It's actually mm. very patriarchal. It's yeah, very it pro-traditional yeah. American ca- capitalist. It's actually very very, very, very Christian in its origins, and it's very messianic, and it's premised on this concept, which I find very problematic, I call the politics of redemption. The politics of redemption is this concept that we have to prove to white people that we are human by doing all this nice, good stuff and say, look, white folk, we've showed you that we can govern ourselves and we're good. It it ties into the politics of respectability. See, the politics of redemption and the politics of respectability are tied in. One is the opposite of the other. The politics of the respectability is when you have elite uh, uh, upper middle class blacks who will shame the poor and say, yeah, you know, you darkies are not acting the right way. You guys are messing it up for us. Y'all need to get together. And by the way, Booker T. Washington engaged in this. Du Bois engaged in this. Malcolm X engaged in this. This mm-hmm. is a po- this politics of respectability is something that is consistent in black leadership. Uh, Dr. King really didn't do it too much. He was that was that something that he engaged in publicly, and I, I give him credit for that. But And the thing that's ironic is that it's a very consistent theme amongst black leaders in the black nationalist strain. Marcus Garvey did that excessively. If you go on YouTube and you look at Marcus Garvey YouTube about his speech, he basically sounds like uh, Bill Cosby in to the, with the pound cake speech. The way he speaks derogatorily of the black poor is like, you know, the black man needs to get himself together and motivate himself. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very pejorative Speaking cadence, and this, and the 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 con, the other side of this politics of respectability is this politics of redemption that is very connected to black nationalism. That we need to prove ourselves to white people. We have to prove that we can. And remember the, the article we talked about. I know we don't want to digress about how uh, uh, Tom Joyner was saying that Obama's unable to hire. Uh, yeah. Black, uh, yeah. uh, uh, black people for his cabinet because of the behavior of Kwame the Kilpatrick corruption. and yeah. Jesse Jackson. That, that, listen, that is such a backwards coon thing. I mean, it's insane to me. That I, I would agree. Was such a megaphone in the black community and is considered a thought leader to call us all corrupt. 
to get to he was sure. given he was given a microphone to black to black community so that he could tell us all that we're too corrupt to actually you know be in a sure. places of power. And I said on Facebook another time, I said, shout out to the next white president or white political politician who says, I can't give you Negroes jobs because your boy Tom Joyner says that you guys are just too shaky. I mean, this is what this is what this kind of discourse sets up in the black community. Yeah. And this is old. This, this, this has been going on for years. We do it on all levels. Bill Cosby did it. And, and, and black folk, you know, I always get this shit. I put a question on my Facebook page one day. And it caused a lot of controversy. I said, after white supremacy. After white supremacy, true or untrue, that the black middle class and the black elite is most to blame for the lack of progress in the black community. People are like, well, like, whoa, whoa, what are you, what are you trying to say? I said, you know, I said, I said, I said, remove white supremacy and all of its manifestations. Is there a role that the black elite and the black middle class have had in the lack of progress in the black community? And people were like, no, that's not true. I said, oh, really? I said, well, I guess you guys don't know that in the early 20th century, the National Urban League went on a campaign to exclude black poor people from housing through their housing arm and make sure that elite Negroes were able to get housing before them. And that wow, one of the I didn't know that. One of the, exe- the chief executive secretary of the National Urban League at that time literally went to white real estate orders and said, you can charge us more rent. Up the right. In other words, I'm, I'm, I want to in, encourage you to price gouge black people so we can give keep these shiftless Negroes out. Wow. Well, and, and, and here, here's here's the follow up question. A lot of what you said to me is is derives from a space of a black people or a black group of people that care more about how white people feel about them than actually creating well, who they are and being happy. This is. But what this what is, is the, that? Is that some kind of disease? I mean, I, I'm, and I'm not I'm not kidding. I'm not I'm not I'm not kidding. But I, I've said a long time ago that part of the problem with black people is that we react as children. You know, it's it's uh, the first thing that we ask ourselves is what will white people think? And that shouldn't be a question. That shouldn't even come up in your mind. Well, why do you care what white people think? So my question to you is, what part of us? Like, where does that come from? What does that derive from that we have to care about what white people think first and then worry about our community second? Well, I think that that reality stems from history. It stems from the fact that um, the identification of self that we have as a people, we've identified ourselves through our relationship with white people. You know, in terms of, you know, they, they were they have historically been viewed as the ones who give us access to everything, our identities, our jobs, our education, our schooling, you know, so. That the, the, the kind of, I would almost kind of perverse relationship that we have had historically with the white infrastructure has made us dependent on them for validation historically. But I would make the argument that after 150 some odd years from emancipation, for Negroes to be acting in that way today is a rather pathetic statement about the state of, of uh, personal and racial development that uh, collectively black people have. And this is not exclusive to African Americans. You find this colonial mentality amongst blacks in the Caribbean. I mean, even in my ancestral homeland of Haiti, my parents, well, was a country that literally defeated the Europeans for independence, you still find this colonized thinking that, you know, we got to be careful about, you know, you know, in Korea, we say, people, new breaks out blondie. You know, we're afraid what white people say. You know, is it, oh, fait ça parce que c'est blanc. Oh, you can't do that because you're going to offend the white folks. That mentality exists even in Haiti. Even in Haiti. So this this is a pathology of white supremacy that we have that is one of the most noxious and vile pathologies. It, it is. I'm not trying to deny yet. Yes, this is a, a product of white supremacy is that you look at white people as the holy grail of standards for what you need to adopt to achieve anything in society. And as a result, there there are. Uh, Approval becomes necessary for your functionality. And I, I reject that notion wholesale. It is pathological. And for one reason that it's pathological is that it never ends because you never get their approval. No. It's like a, it's like a stick, a carrot stick. They just keep, keep dangling out there. You'd be a good Negro. Yeah, and you never, wear a tie to work, you know, yeah, and you, you. It's, it's, I mean, it's 2012 and you have Negro saying 13. things like you can't, we can't make. We can't, 2013, excuse me, and we can't be well saying that we can't make demands of Obama because it's going to make him seem like he's showing favoritism. Really? Who's, what, what political 
constituency in America says that. We can't make demands of the president because it's going to make him seem like he's showing favoritism. How, 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 banal, how insipid is that thinking? And you have thought leaders, you have, you have scholars, academics, black political figures, people who are the black shattering class who will yap this cool and speak all day. Yeah, that, oh, that, the, the, the rationale is he can't do anything for us because doing something for us, meaning black people or poor people, you know, means that, you know, black poor people specifically, not black people, because nobody we, and we need to we need to touch on that quickly, too, because he could be doing something for Diddy or Jay-Z. That's not the issue. Those people are still black. Um, I think part of the part you brought up is that this is a class issue. This is about poor people. And, you know, to, keep, to continue to make it about black people, you know, is a problem because there are black rich people. There are black middle class people this isn't about black people this is about the poor and the poor also includes poor white people you know and i and i and i i think Absolutely. i think i think we have to to grapple with that and i think what you said and what you touched on was that this is this is about class and to make it about race continues that kind of uh um, you know divisive kind of keeps keeps white people thinking they have something when they really don't you're poor you're in jail you know you 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 live in the trailer park so it's not just about it's not just about black people we have a lot of black people who are doing well who ate in the bed in this kind of I thinking put this, I, put, I put something on my facebook page today before this conversation i said listen racism is designed to obscure white people from the reality that the political and economic order damages them, not as much as black people, but in larger numbers than black people. You always hear people say that almost 49, almost 50 percent of prisons are made up of people of color. Well, you never know. You know what you don't hear in the converse? More than half of jails are filled with poor whites. How come you never hear that? How come you didn't hear anyone say more than half of jails are filled with poor whites? Why? You know why? Because when people start saying that, they're like, oh, hold on, wait. Maybe there is something to this prison industrial complex and, and mass incarceration. But yeah. we don't talk like that. You know why? Because we engage in this really vile racial essentialism where we end up pathologizing ourselves. And say, oh, well, black folk have a problem with their diet, so we need to make documentaries to show that we eat poorly. Well, do you realize that poor eating and poor diet and poor health is a, con is a, is a construct of poverty? And the reason why black people suffer from this point is because more of us are poor. Surprise, surprise. So yeah, it, it, it's, it's all it's what it's all to demean it's it's all to kind of demean us. Like that's that's the one thing I find. Well, even when even people talk about no, black it's, health, it's worse than that. No, no, it's worse no, than no. that. It's not just it's worse than that. It's not just me. You know what? It's so Negroes can make money on a race hustle. Because yeah. now when you see Negroes have dietary wow. problems, I can make movies and films and programs yeah. to deal with. This goes back, and you know the person who really and I know I mentioned this guy's name. I'm sure people are tired of me talking about him. And, and the reason why I've come to this understanding is reading someone who I've said publicly to many black scholars, you see that I talk to on, on Facebook, is probably the, the last serious black intellectual we have in America, and that's Adolph Reed Jr. Adolph Reed touches on all of this. He's been talking about this for almost 20 years, about how no one talks about class and its role in damaging the black community. And one of the things he discusses is this thing, what I call, he has a different frame for it, he call, I call it race ideology management and race management. That you create a whole industry of cottage jobs, cottage industry of jobs dealing with race issues that's filled by who? The black elite. Yeah. You know, all your social services, not, yeah. your, all your non-governmental organizations in the hood, in Chicago, in New York, in Detroit, where you're doling out little bit, kibbles and bits to the Negroes in the ghetto, who staffs those jobs? Yeah, that's right. These are these are black people. These are black people making money off of off of off of this. You know, well, there has to be something done about black people. You know, there has to be something about all these violent black boys. that are going to be organizations that, that, that say, hey, we exactly. and, and, and and nobody's really touching on this. This is this kind of kill each other thing is what happens in poverty. Every every impoverished city around the world that you see has this kind of systemic violence where the people are attacking each other. This is not something that's, that just happens to young black boys. It's been the history around the world. Let me tell you something. I had, listen, I had a conversation with a, a Haitian friend of mine who's a lawyer. We, it got to the point where I told him I can't talk to him anymore. First of all, he started talking to me about Thomas Sowell, who, I mean, we, oh, he well, said, let's not go there. Oh, well, Thomas Sowell, you see the YouTube of Thomas Sowell where he's talking about welfare, how welfare destroyed the black community. When I was growing up in Harlem, Harlem was great. It was wonderful. It was welfare that destroyed everything. It was welfare. <laughs> you know, I said, well, you know, whatever. 
at these porch monkeys when they say this stupid nonsense. I'm like, you know, who pays these fools? I said, listen, I guess, I guess Thomas Sowell didn't read the Philadelphia Negro or didn't read E. Franklin Frazier's studies from the 20s when they're talking about single parenthood crime were endemic in the black community back then. So maybe, maybe Thomas Sowell was living in some kind of halcyon days of the romanticized Harlem where they weren't pimps and pushers. I guess he didn't read the fire next time. He didn't read um, uh, James Baldwin, who talks about his childhood in Harlem and the kind of crime that he had to deal with. So I, where, where did Thomas Sowell escape? that in the Harlem that he was living in? These halcyon romantic days where welfare didn't exist and everything was wonderful. And this is another thing that Professor Reed talks about, the, the romanticization, the romanticization of Jim Crow. You know, the Negroes were talking about back in the day before integration, things were wonderful. It was amazing. It was integration and all this post, this post civil rights stuff that got us jacked up. Negroes were getting lynched, hang, hung, and killed. And you're talking about you want to romanticize that nonsense as a way to pathologize behavior that's going on today? What is wrong with you? And these are Negroes who are professors at Harvard, Yale, MIT. These are people who are the thought leaders. These are the go-to people the establishment uses. No, I, I can't see you. Come back into the camera. I can't see you. Hold on a second. I can't see you. Okay. The other side. Yeah, okay. I'm just making sure. <laughs> these are, these are the, the go-to go people that are used in the black community. I'm talking about people from, you know, I name names. I don't care. Skip Gates, uh, even Cornell West, all of them. Mm -hmm. These are the go-to people that are used to basically. I mean, you know, I, you know, you look at you look at the comments people like William Julius Wilson, who's a, who's a black sociologist, were making in the eighties and nineties about poor black poor black people. Oh, we have an internal pathology in the black. People. There's a certain nihilism that is affecting the black poor that we need to deal with. So in other words, there's some kind of inbred genetic pathology that Negroes have. It's the, it's the bell curve. It's, well, it's the bell curve all over again, you know. We're not smart you know, enough. We don't have what white people very, have. We're genetically impaired. Let me, tell you, let me tell you something. This is a very important point. I want, I, I'm glad we're touching on this. I need to discuss this. Is that, you know, some people will say, well, well, there are problems we have in the black community. The problems we have in the black community are the problems of poverty. And let, let me make a point, and this is going to really offend people. I just finished a very, very good book by uh, Khalil Gibran Muhammad called the, the Condemnation of Blackness. I really suggest people read this book. The book talks about how social science studies like Darwinism were used to pathologize black people into criminals. Basically, how all of this discourse about, you know, whether or not crime was a product of race or culture, this concept of pathologizing blackness and identifying with crime by the way, guess when this started? In the 1890s. Ding, ding, ding. Colored Farmers Alliance, Black Progressive Era. That's when this whole thinking started in the 1890s. This pathologizing of blackness and relating it to crime. Are you noticing certain connections here? Mm -hmm. You're seeing the timing here. Okay? And this, and this is what's interesting. When you look at the European immigrants who were also being stigmatized with this same behavior, Degenerates. I mean, you know, you, if you read the way they talked about Italians, Jews, and Irish, you think they talk about black folk. Degenerates, single parent, children out of wedlock, immoral, loose, blah, blah, blah. How did their white peers talk about them to the establishment to address their issues? You know what they did? They didn't make these essentialist politics of respectability arguments. They said there are structural problems and policy issues that are causing our poor from Europe to act in this fashion. Khalid, uh, uh, Professor Muhammad deals with this very well in the condemnation of blackness. How if you compare the discourse of people like Du Bois to people who were Europeans or whites who were addressing the issues of the white poor, they were not, they were not pathologizing their behavior, which was the same as black folk. They were not pathologizing their quote-unquote dysfunction, which was the same as black folk. They were appealing to the infrastructure of the government and the private sector to implement policy that alleviated their suffering. But what were the good Negroes of the black elite doing? Y'all darkies need to get your stuff together. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a powerful point. And I'm, I'm just going to we're going to do this again. I just want everybody to know we're going to do this again. But I want to I want to I want to end um in a in a in a in a in a in a, a kind of interesting way. I'm just going to give you um, a couple of names, and I just want to tell you. I just want to. I just want you to tell me um, what is the first thing that comes to your mind, or just a quick, a quick like 10 second snippet of what you of what you think about who that person is, what they represent. Just what comes to your mind. I'm just going to throw a couple names out there for you. Um, the first is a uh, Torre of MSNBC. 
<laughs> oh, man, you you sending you sending you sending guns with loaded bullets. <laughs> he was like, here's a Glock, fully stacked. I just, I just oh. a few seconds. Just tell me. Just tell me. You know, just not I, long. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, gonna wrap it up. I think Torre is a product of the media status quo's attempt to take non-threatening black voices and use them as a representation of black thought in order to create a consensus around ideas that are generally not represented in the organic elements of the black community. You know what? On that, I'm just going to end it on that. That was beautiful. I'm just going to end it right there. I'm just going to end it right there. I want to thank you, Pascal, for being with us today. We're going to continue this conversation. Um, I'm just going to end it right here for today. But uh, we're going to continue this conversation because uh, I learned a lot today. So I appreciate that. All right? No problem.